As we mentioned earlier, Donald Trump and Jeb Bush's feud is extending past the debate stage. And now we're hearing that Trump said that he doesn't want Bush's support if the front runner gets the nomination. He reportedly went on to say that Bush, quote, does not represent strength, power, and stamina, which are qualities our country desperately needs. With us now from Washington is Time political reporter Zeke Miller. So, Zeke, you know, this beef between Donald Trump and Jeb Bush is starting to devolve. Um, even more so, I guess. What do you make of this feud? Is this the most effective way for Jeb Bush uh, to really kind of make inroads here at this point? You know, this was a really calculated strategy on Jeb Bush's part on Tuesday night in that debate. He wanted, uh, you know, he wanted to stay out of the Marco Rubio and, Je and, and Ted Cruz fight, which we're seeing play out in sort of a separate stage. But he also had to demonstrate strength, demonstrate resolve, demonstrate to his donors and supporters that despite his really low poll numbers, he's not going anywhere. And picking a fight with Donald Trump is a really good way of doing that. And the way that he went about doing that was also, you know, fairly, you know, fairly strategic. It was about, you know, here's my policy for, for foreign policy and Donald Trump is not serious. So he got his foreign policy out there a little bit and then came with the punch on the back end. Um, on the, and at this point, because Jeb Bush has gotten better at this, he's not standing down, it's a, it's a bit of a win for, for, for him because he's now the only one really combating Donald Trump head on. Yeah, that's so true, Zeke. He's really the only one willing to insult him to his face, literally, uh, on, the, on the debate stage. And we're talking about him now, whereas leading up to the debate, you know, we really weren't talking much about Jeb Bush. It, unless we were talking about whether or not his campaign has any legs at all. Now, following the debate, what do you think? Do you think uh, his campaign is dead in the water, or do you see a spark there? You know, th th that's exactly right. We're talking about Jeb Bush in a context that isn't, you know, sort of what we call the campaign death watch, you know, when's he going to drop out? Now it's, you know, maybe there's an, a, a second act there. What's notable about that exchange with Donald Trump is that it wasn't designed to influence voters. You know, you're not going to see too many people running to Jeb Bush. It didn't you know, it wasn't the type of thing that's going to shift the poll numbers very much. What it did was it stopped the slide. It kept the money coming in. All the sorts of things that Jeb Bush needs to survive through the end of the year. The Bush campaign is betting that the campaign resets on January 3rd. People come back from the holidays, come back from the new year, uh, and wake up and like, oh, now it's time to get serious. And then they can start getting their message out uh, with, new, with new force and new vigor. Um, that's a very calculated bet. I mean, the question is, will it pay off? Uh, Zeke, I want to ask you about Marco Rubio, who's had his sights set on Ted Cruz. Uh, Senator Rubio has blasted Ted Cruz's 2013 immigration amendment. I know you wrote an article about this. Explain why Marco Rubio's hits against Ted Cruz matter. So you, the Rubio contention here is that he introduced this amendment in 2013 uh, to the Gang of Eight immigration bill that would have re removed the, uh, the path to citizenship from the, from the bill, and it would have left a, a pathway to legalization, a pathway to legal status for the 11 million people here in the United States uh, without legal status. Um, what the, the, the challenge is, so Mark Rubio contends that Ted Cruz thereby supported the legal, legal status for, the, for those people. Ted Cruz was trying to divide Democrats and Republicans and those who covered that at the time acknowledged he wasn't really supporting it. He wanted that bill to fail in its entirety, and this was a calculated and strategic move for him to do that. What the genius of, what the, of the Marco Rubio attack here is that it, A, paints Ted Cruz as something of a flip-flopper, because if, you were to, if you're not familiar with the legislative strategy, with the, with the history involved, it looks like he's changing his position. Additionally, the Ted Cruz response has to be, oh, I was trying to poison this bill, which makes Ted Cruz look like part of the Republican establishment he's trying to fight. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a two-pronged assault from Marco Rubio. He sort of let Ted Cruz into this trap, um, and it's doing some damage. Uh, let's talk about Chris Christie. Uh, he's really been focusing on New Hampshire. He barely has any infrastructure anywhere else, and he's certainly seen his numbers improve in New Hampshire. But what do you think of this strategy beyond that state? You know, he really doesn't have any other alternative. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the way of looking at it, Chris Christie right now. For him, you know, he, he doesn't have the money that Jeb Bush has. He doesn't have the support nationwide that, say, Marco Rubio or a Ted Cruz or a Donald Trump have. He needs to go to New Hampshire. It's a state that's, you know, sort of the politics are, are opportune for him. If he, if he moves there, if he sets his whole campaign base out of operations there, he very likely could pull off a win or a very close second, and then there would be a lot of momentum behind him. But if he were to start planning for March 1st, he would never have that opportunity. So it's sort of, that's a good problem for him to have, not having the, the organization for those March 1st Super Tuesday states. Um, but he's betting there, you know, if he can pull off the New Hampshire thing, then maybe Jeb Bush moves to the sidelines. And he's also betting on the governors, unlike a lot of the other candidates. 
you know, Chris Christie was the chairman of the Republican Governors Association, has a lot of chits to call on nationwide, and governors are really the only people, and more so than senators and members of Congress, have vast political organizations that are ready to stand up in a state that he can activate. So if he can pick up five, six, seven governors after a New Hampshire win, which people close to him think they might be able to accomplish, there, you know, there could be some built-in momentum, some organizations that he can reach out to without having to build one up from scratch. All right, Time Political reporter Zeke Miller in Washington. Zeke, thanks for your analysis. Uh, thanks for having me.